welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Good Chalk Podcast. In this edition of the Good Chalk Podcast, we'll be as titling this episode or edition, the, well, Strickland got robbed. But did he really get robbed? Did he not? Or is that really even the whole point of this video? We'll get into it. So, um, yeah, so really what I want to, what we want to talk about in this episode or this edition is UFC 297 and then wrap it up with Kayla Harrison joining the UFC. But let's talk about UFC 297 and link all these things together with, you know, inconsistent rules, inconsistent judging, and inconsistent refing. This is a lot of inconsistencies in MMA. You know, still, what, as far as the popular MMA, is only about well, maybe like 30 years old, maybe a little bit, a little bit older, maybe a little bit younger. So it's kind of going to be... You got to, um, it's to be expected. That's what I'm saying. It's to be expected. So, yeah, let's start from the top to kind of go down to, like, to the bottom. Let's start with the top. Strickland versus um, Duplacis. In Boston, those probably would be called shutout rounds, to be honest, a lot of those rounds. Because in Boston, they don't really score that whole, a whole lot of swinging and wild and missing and whiffing. The guy landing the cleaner, sti like the stiffer jabs and stuff like that, typically going to be winning rounds. They would like it. Just like in um, Tyson Fury versus Wilder one, oh, Wilder put on not not Wilder said Fury put on a Boston clinic, even though over the course of what twelve rounds still outlanded him by like ten strikes total strikes, not power, not this, only by ten total strikes. They say oh he put on a Boston clinic over Wilder in the first fight. Sean Strickland landed um, about like at least thirty more significant total strikes than placing that fight, but in him being the champion. He didn't get the decision, so a little bit crazy. Is it like a robbery? No, especially when you consider this is MMA, not boxing. Oh, he got a couple of takedowns he did nothing with, but Strickland should have won. Was it a robbery? No, but the better decision would have been Strickland. And then, you know, the thing when people was talking about, oh, you know, getting on Cruz about the commentating he made or the comedy he made about the cut could have an effect. He was really <laughs> making fun of the judging in a couple of these fights on the car where – you know, like the um, Tavares versus Sir, it was a city fight where city was pressure the whole time. Value and had um, Tavares on the back foot pretty much the whole fight. And because he got a cut, the judges swayed it away from, you know, he was one really putting in most of the work, doing most of the damage to control the fight, and he didn't get the decision. He had um, Katona versus um, Arnfield fight. Katona did, you know, what people feel. Um, Drickus did, he did way better against Arnfield. He should have won. He was out there pressuring the whole time. Arnfield was dipping off every, at a two-minute mark every single round. He got taken down. He got actual control time, you know, more, especially around the third round. Got, I think, two takedowns in, like, two minutes of control time in that third round. And also in his home, home, home country, and then get a decision. Whereas Drickus got landed by, like, 30 significant strikes. He denied his home country. He's a challenger. Like, so, be consistent. If you're going to favor completely sloppy striking, why not a technical striker that's getting real takedowns, real control time, and actually outlanding his opponent versus sloppy striking, headbutting, like, be consistent. So, if that's right, if they want to judge how they judge in the main event, why did they judge that in the city fight? When City was pressing forward the whole time, he was dealing down the whole time, outlanding his opponent the whole time. Katona was out there pressuring his opponent the whole time, scoring takedowns, shut his opponent down in takedown, he had three to four takedowns to zero. So why is that inconsistent? They're gonna they on judge a certain way the whole card up. Then in the main event they're gonna switch up. So those guys that deserve to get decisions didn't get them. Then the guy that didn't deserve it he got it. And yes, yeah, this very inconsistent. So Cruz was very much on point because for whatever reason that night they were judging cuts like it's like got a bleeding damage to it. Like oh you got a cut so you're losing a fight. Yes you might have a, like like stumbled your opponent several times in this fight. Yes, you rip him to the body, have him leaning over. You stalk him down the whole fight. Yes, he kind of caught you a little bit, but you still got got right back up and kept pressuring him. But, hey, you were bleeding, so you lost that round. It was some weird judging. So Cruz, even though you could get on him, it's really y'all who supporting this, the BS saying, like, oh, he lost because he got a cut. So Cruz was mocking y'all. Then y'all tried to turn it back on him. But Cruz was actually very valid in his insult of the judging that night because judging on that night was all over the place. And then... Finally, I'm gonna kind of jump a little bit back. Mobs are Evloyev versus um versus Arnold Allen, and 
this is not a bad judging necessarily here. I'm not going to say I feel the right person won. I don't feel like there was no robbery at all. The right man won. But what is inconsistent is the ruling. In some states, in some countries, one hand down is enough. In some countries, you got to have two hands down. In some, pl- I mean, in some, some places, it's like you can need, you know, here, need there, or not. It's just very inconsistent. And um, as some, I think all those needs that um, Allen landed were actually legal because I don't think I had any one of those t- of those knees every single time a lawyer's hand was slightly off the ground. So, yeah, it's just stuff need to be fixed. I feel if anything, they should just make down knees to a down opponent should be legal. I'm not saying face stomps or soccer kicks like old school pride, but I feel knees to a down opponent should be acceptable. So one hand down, two hands down, a knee a knee down, you should be able to get knee to head. Matter of fact, two knees down, should be a knee to head. Maybe if you like on your stomach, maybe that's not stomach or back, you should, can't be knee. But I feel if you're on your knees, on a hand or anything. Unless you're like flat on your stomach, you should not be able to get knee. That's that's where it should be. Flat on your stomach or flat on your back, you can't be knee. That's where it should be. And no face stomps, no soccer kicks. I feel like that should be the rule. And as people learn how to defend it in Pride, they'll learn how to defend it in UFC. And people learn how to defend it in 1FC. And if anything, I feel people playing the rules allow them to get knee even more so when you um, – trying to play the game like, oh, I can't get B-Need here. So I'm so focused on trying to stand back up or put a hand down so I'm leaving my head wide open versus like I do like this, I'm blocking. I'm blocking. I'm blocking my head. I'm like, but now you just playing the game, you just leave your face wide open because you're like, oh, I'm I'm defending by touching the ground. Defend, touching the ground don't defend your face. It plays the game. So in prior, people learn how to defend the knees from all positions, on their back, on their stomach, on their knee, one hand, and work back up. Or you could do the Chuck Liddell path where really, matter of fact, even when, just literally just trying to stand straight back up to defend yourself better than putting a hand down. Because you're still caught on playing the game of because you're trying to avoid not getting hit with a knee coming up, that you're getting hit with knees all in between. And like, oh, I got knee here, ref. I got knee here, ref. Versus just standing up. And maybe you eat one knee and then you just stand up. I suppose they're hitting, eating 10 knees because you're trying to play the game. But um, yeah, ain't consistent about I've been all over the place with this one, but how do you feel about the judging that night in the main event and some other key fights? You feel about the judging and also the rules. Do you feel like the rules need to be changed or they at least need to be consistent? Like, how do you feel about all those things? Yeah, I think, uh, man, sometimes the UFC is so on point and sometimes they're just all over the place. Like uh, the Patty Pimblett versus Jared Gordon, like Jared Gordon clearly had a massive amount of control time was getting hit with little baby punches, like to the side, to the back, uh, to the side of the head, to the, you know, in, in the body a little bit, but like for the most part, he did most of the controlling. And like, I can look at the Garrett Armfield situation like that. Like uh, things happen, you know what I mean? Bracketone, I, I believe one as well. Um, but I think in a championship fight, I think the person the challenger, like, yeah, he got what three, four, I don't know how many takedowns they even said he had, but he took him down and he got almost right back up. And if he didn't, they struggled for a second and then he got up, which, you know, I can, I can see those them giving points for that. But as far as damage, like when Sean Strickland got head buffed by Drake is plus E coming out of like a little tussle between the two of them, that's when his eye got cut. Like he's done it in slow motion and he's like, I, I, I don't complain, but let's be honest. Like I lost because I couldn't see. And if the ref saw him get head butted and then, you know what I mean? Made the decision there. I think, I think that's not what Sean Strickland would do. And I, I, he would, he'd be like, I'm good, but still giving him the opportunity to say, listen, you just got head butted. Your eye just got busted open. Like, Let's let's make sure that, you know what I mean? Maybe you need time to reset because getting headbutted is a whole different animal. Did you see the headbutt? Yes, all the headbutt. And another thing is to kind of jump off that right there is I feel strictly, you know, that he can be a little bit too tough for his own good or too dumb for his own good. He could have definitely um said, oh, I got headbutted there. And, you know, they, they would have said, could you continue? Like, yeah, he's like, hell yeah, I can continue. That's what he definitely would say. I can continue. I'm not. Quitting or nothing, but in you know recognizing the head, but 
he could have, you know, they could say, oh, it was a headbutt. They could rewind the tape back. And then when you typically get headbutt, you know, cut gets open due to a headbutt. They know it's open due to a headbutt. They'll wipe the blood off. They, you know, that would give, have say, you know, that would have given him a better chance to win a round. He didn't lose the fight necessarily. Like, oh, he lost every single round after he got cut because he won the fifth round. But right. I think the cut happened in the fourth, the fourth round. And, you know, he was wiping blood oh, out of his oh, eye the whole time. Yeah. I don't know if it was third or fourth, but it was one of those rounds. So. And that's, yeah. yeah. And he lost that round because of that cut, you know. And not necessarily because the cut won the fight. It was because the cut hindered him and he was not as sharp in that, in that round. He was flooding a lot. He was just trying to, you know, stay offensive as best he can, but he couldn't really see what he was doing that well. But, um, yeah, that was, that, you know, that would have taken, you know, higher fight IQ or, you know, situational awareness, which is hard. You know, you're fighting a big fight, your first title defense and whatnot. So you're not dinking all this stuff. You know, maybe guys that have 20 defense, defenses like John Jones, GSPs, those people, Volkanovskis, and, yeah, you know, like the people that have become truly, truly great. Like they said, I've been here, done that. They're going to find ways to get the time they need. They're going to fight like, oh, I got hit enough. I'm going to take 20 minutes if I need to. Oh, I got to cut. Oh, I'm on complaining to the ref. I'm playing to, playing to the ref about the eye poke, complaining about everything, so that I can you know get the best chance I get, the best um, shake I can get out of this. But um, yeah, I feel like that was definitely more so a Strickland error. I mean, the, it's not his error as far as getting cut, but how he reacted to it, you know, because in hindsight you can't go back and say, oh, it was a cut, this and that. When in the time being, you know, if you did have that situational awareness, you could have said, oh, I got a head, but I'm bleeding or but again, then again, like I don't think he cared too much that he got hit by the fact that he bled afterwards. And it's not like he would have been like a champ, yeah. Yeah. If he didn't feel that blood, I mean like I or he clearly won the fight. Like the if if they didn't if they like yeah, Dracus was doing giving a lot of pressure, but like at the end of the day, Dracus was not doing damage. Sean Strickland's jabs mangled Dracus Duplessis' face. Like his face compared to Sean Strickland. Sean Strickland had a little cut, but a lot of blood. Whereas Drake's Duplessis eyes were getting swollen shut, face was getting swollen. Like it, 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 they they say, damage is the the number one uh, factor in in who wins, and I I think that that wasn't fair. Yeah, I think they also like I said the same thing with Cruz was you know, mocking the judges and the fans who all you know behind it this garbage night of judging. Um, I think that the because the fact that Strickland didn't call it. I think the judges thought that um, the cut came from actually drifting places, landing the elbow or a punch. They don't think they don't think they acknowledge it is a headbutt. I don't think they even acknowledge the headbutt until you know well after the fight when Strickland mentioned it. So uh, they probably said, "Oh, well, he his eyes swelled up, but he's bleeding. That's more visible, like blood dripping down his face. Yes, his eyes swelled up, but it's not bleeding or nothing." Versus Strickland, his whole head on the side is covered in blood on top, and that looks more visible. So. The judges definitely were smoking some cannabis or something. I don't know. They were on something that night, and they were like favoring blood way too much. Like I understand it's significant, but I feel like in a city fight, it didn't do nothing. Like the blood wasn't stopping city. City was outpacing them the whole time, so it's not like the, the blood in any of those fights. More so in the Strickland fight, it did something for one round. City fight, it didn't stop city at all, and no his pace at all, and none of the round. But um, yeah, I definitely that night they were favoring blood for whatever reason way too much and they were treating like oh like oh he's bleeding in this round give him some extra points or oh, give the other guy some extra points because the other guy's bleeding so let's give him some extra points so like they were they were treating like it was a video game and they would give him multipliers for blood <laughs> it was some it was some ridiculous judging that night yeah but um and even on you really look at stuff like you know you know people say all this dumb stuff and make it like seem like it was really that great of a case to say drick deserved to win even the punches Drick is landing. If you actually watch any bit of box, any bit of striking, you're not just a two, three year fan or nothing, and you just like go with the flow. I just hate Strickland because I don't agree with political about. Like you just watch stuff. You want got a good eye for it. The shots Drick is Drick is the places are directly the places was landing. A lot of those shots were pushing. Like Strickland was out of range, and Drick is literally leaping. You know, already missing, then jumping with his punches to land them, and well, then and on top of that. Too- like uh, uh, Alex Pereira was doing it a lot his last fight, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but Strickland throws his hand out there, so the punch usually misses. Like he's very good at letting someone come in with the punch and then yeah. deflecting it just by like throwing his arm out there. And there, I saw a whole lot of that, and that's what won him the 
Izzy fight, and that's why I think he won this fight because he wasn't hit as much as they probably thought he was. Yeah, and I say, and even the shots that were landing, they were you were looking at like you know in a real legit combat, like a not combat, but a real legit striking sport, especially like boxing. They were not the judges like they probably would score those as landed shots, but they would not rate them like two clean jabs over like ten of those ugly strikes that the places were landing that were like you were already. First, already out of your range, you fully extend your shot, and then you kind of just leaping, and they are kind of rolling out of range because it, it would know like you're rolling with the shot, so they already out of range. That shot missed, they stand you rolling. That shot has no power on it. You could a uh, full on Superman flew at the dude, dude from that range, it would have done no damage. And so, like, legit, especially like Boston, they would not really rate with a lot of the strikes that drinks the places. The places might land at 60 strikes, they probably say, Oh, he might land like 60 good strikes, though, fight with Strickland. Janice, he might have landed 70 good shots. In the Boston, they would say he had got a clinic put on him. That's what they would have said. He had got a clinic put on him. He looked like a square up amateur. And Strickland went out there and put a Boston clinic on Beautiful. this amateur. Yeah. That's, that's what they would have said if this was a box map. But again, rule it may still very much new. And the way they see things is very much this and whatnot. But um, yeah, so uh, I definitely think they overrated um the place he's offense, his activity. But he really had little, very little substance. His takedowns didn't get no substance with his shots that he mostly landed were out of range and really all the, the zap on it was taken out of them. V very much, I would say 90% of his shots he threw were pushing punches <laughs> and probably 95% that he landed were pushing punches that don't have no real value to them. And the most damage he did was from a headbutt. <laughs> That's literally the, the only, like literally the only effective damage he did was via headbutt. That's crazy as it may seem. He had all that offense, but the most only damage, legit damage he did was a headbutt. And like that, that, like all the close talk, put that at like the people watching this, put this in your head. That's the only damage he did was a headbutt because other shots were pushing, like legit pushing. And watch like probably some boss fight, some classic boss fight, or any boss fight. Watch some boss fight. That's you watch these lower tier guys and watch how much trash they talk about these guys and they're pushing punches. Then look at the places he's like creating, like these legit world, I'm not world champ, legit, you know. Career boxers, and you can see them critiquing them. And look at the place he's like, this guy legit striking was gar garbanzo trash. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just rapping on. No, no, I but, totally uh, agree. I th I think you brought up a lot of good points, and I think that you know it needs to be addressed because even Dana White thought that Sean Strickland won. Like I th I thought Sean Strickland won before the judges even you know gave their decision to Bruce Buffer, but like. When I watched Dana White confirm, I was like, all right, well, he's someone who's seen how many fights. He could probably tell pretty easily who who's winning and who's losing without, you know, ever being a judge. But I, I, I do agree. And I think I think it needs to change because people like Sean Strickland, who won the belt against all odds, still deserve to have his belt wrapped around him. And, and that didn't happen. And, and because of a couple takedowns that, you know, were sloppy like Jared Gordon like I said Jared Gordon's control time on Patty Pimblett was insane compared to you know what the judges saw so I definitely agree what um what do you think about Israel Adesanya though and uh Drake Estuplessy I think it's a good fight it's a little bit of overdue I want to say it's not overdue because Drake has really turned the fight down when he had the opportunity to have that fight and then Adesanya lost to Strickland so I guess it's happening at the right time. I think, and I think, to be honest, it's, you know, you know, Kamaru Uzman, Francis Ngannou, and Adesanya should have been had an Africa card. They should have been had that. They had the perfect opportunity to do that, and they didn't. Yeah, that kind I of pissed me off. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, I think now is he's not going to get the same effect. You know, he lost all these champions now, but um, especially Ngannou, who's doing big things in boxing, but – I think this will be a pretty decent card to, to host in Africa. Instead of trying to fit this on the UFC 300, I think they should um, set up the UFC Africa card. But who knows? I feel like it sounds so easy. To... Yeah, it sounds so easy to say, like set it up. But it feel you know, sometimes they just set things up like this. Like, oh, that was so easy for us to do. We just did it like that. We just saw the right matchup appear, and we just scheduled a matchup like for the end of the year, November. <laughs> then sometimes it's like, oh, it takes them five years to fight in a certain country or fight in this area or fight in this venue. So in my mind, I feel like it would take two years before they set that event up. Like they would have to know well in advance or something or already have had an Africa card planned for this year in hopes that um, 
Drake is the place he will win, or Adesanya will win his belt back, or there will be some African champion. And then it just was like, oh, we already had the schedule for this year, and now we got the perfect matchup happen, and now we already have event scheduled, and we're going to make them headline it. But I don't know. If they can do it, it would be awesome they could do it this year. But if things are supposed to go the way they make it seem so difficult to happen, I doubt it will happen. But, yeah, if the African card is on the line, then UFC 300. But there's a chance to have a UFC Africa card by the end of this year. I mean, not by the end of this year, but before this year ends, I think that would be a perfect headliner for that card. Probably put it in South Africa because Drick is the champion now and have Adesanya face him, and that would be a great fight. And as far as how they match up, I think um, it's a it's a pick em fight, to be honest. You know, at some points, I heavily favor Adesanya, and at some points, I think it's pick em. <laughs> so it kind of straddles between pick em and um, highly favoring um, Adesanya, which is crazy. It's a big range, but I don't highly favor Drick at any point in these things, but I do because he highly favoring scenarios for Adesanya. I feel like Drake is just very much like Marvin Vittori. He don't have the chin of Marvin Vittori. He probably may be a little bit more physically strong than Marvin Vittori. Don't have probably have as good a conditioning. Well, typically, with his nose fix, maybe his conditioning is just as good as Marvin Vittori's. Strike is a little bit better. Maybe have a little bit more power than Marvin Vittori. But I feel like he's very much like Marvin Vittori. I feel like he's... Or even a over- Paulo Costa. I mean, he's more one-dimensional than Paulo Costa. Paulo Costa can kind of, you know fight from any angle, whereas Duplessis kind of just pushes straight forward. And I think that Adesanya is well-equipped to deal with stuff like that, whereas Sean Strickland's very awkward. When you go to hit him, he just goes like like that or like that, or you know what I mean? It knocks the punch out of the way. So I, I agree. He rolls off show. Well, I would say with that is somewhat like, to summarize that, the place really don't got no real defense like that. The, Strickland has one of the better defenses of actually in – Pound for pound in MMA history, statistically. So, Strickland has very good defense, and at this point, it's not even underrated. He has solid defense, one of the better defenses in again in MMA history, regardless of weight class, regardless of errors. One of the better just to, like statistical defenses, like it's educated. In the places like he over swings a lot, and I you know he don't really defend leg kicks as well. I think the people who have beaten out of science all at least have been able to defend his kicks well, like. Pereira was able to defend his kicks well, and you know, kick. Matter of fact, out kick leg to kick them in, in both fights. To be honest, so I, Pereira was able to out kick him and defend his kick. You no know, world class kickboxers versus each other. Um, what's his name? John Blahovitz, you know, was a good kicker as well. He was able to out kick Adesanya a, a bit, or at least be able to address a lot of his kicks in that fight, and then wrestle him and strike him. And Sean Strickland was able to, you know, address his kicks well, but. Duplacey, to me, he don't seem like a guy that checks kicks very well. I think the best thing he's going to try to do with that is probably try to catch the kicks and get score takedown. But again, I feel like he'll, his game plan will be very much similar to Vittori and his build and his attributes and his style is very much similar to Marvin Vittori, who Adesanya is 2-0 and against. And I think Adesanya will do well to deal with that style that he has fought multiple times, not just Marvin Vittori, but other guys that were looking to do the same thing. A mediocre striker. Kamzat deserves it, though. Kamzat don't deserve nothing. <laughs> Kamzat don't deserve Nothing. He need, he need to stop talking and have an actual middleweight fight. That's what he need to do. He need to go out there, call for Robert Whitaker. He need to go out there, try to knock off like a Joe Piper or, you know, somebody that has a little bit of steam behind him, you know, fight a legit um, Bo middleweight Nickel. guy. Huh? Bo Nickel. Nah, Bo Nickel hadn't, haven't done that shit. Bo Nickel was still on amateur island. He's still fighting bums. Like, he ain't fight nobody legit yet. Bo Nickel needs a a legit fight, he's still probably three fights away from a legit fight, or at least two fights away from a legit fight. So, Bo Nickel not the guy. Joe Piper actually put away some okay enough wins, but he needed to... Um, Piper about to get his first probably real ranked fighter in um, Hermanson, but um, yeah, who could he fight? Jared Cannonier is a very good... Matter of fact, Jared Cannonier probably is the guy he should fight. Or if Adesanya doesn't have a dance partner, then fight Adesanya. Or if Sean Strickland's not going to get the next title fight, then give him comments. Like comments are talking about, oh, he been making him quit in the sparring or made him say, or Strickland was saying, go easy on him and stuff. So if he's saying all that stuff, mention Strickland some more, call for that fight, actually sign up for that fight, sign the contract ahead of time, pre-sign that contract, and get it going. Pull, you know, um, I guess what they call it, pull his collar, pull Sean Strickland collar, like force his hand, you know, talk your trash in beyond the trash talking, sign that contract, post a video you with Dana White, tweet to Dana White, tweet to Sean Strickland, spam him up, get that fight to happen, and actually show up. Instead of just kind of just talking in interviews and on tweets, like actually at the man. Twitter, you got you can at people on Twitter. So, you know, give them like t- 10 different acts. So you want this fight, 
You've been talking about you deserve a title fight in this way class and that way class, but now it's time to do a little more than chirping and actually do the, some chirping that's going to get you a fight and do the actions behind it to get that fight. And then the first, the biggest option, I mean, the biggest action, fight the fight and win the fight and win it in an impressive fashion. Then you'll get a title shot. Especially if you go out there and fight Sean Strickland, you, the former champion, this combo fight that he should have won, and then beat him, stop him, treat him like you say you do. You treat him inspiring, and um, yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, I, I I agree. Um, I think we just got one more topic to cover, and that's uh Kayla Harrison, uh, becoming a UFC uh fighter. Yeah, so Kayla Harrison, yeah, it's an interesting one, like. Not just for her coming over, which is probably the most interesting thing, but the second and very close second most interesting thing is that this fight, she's already got an opponent. It's Holly Holm, and the fight's at 135. So we already know she's a, with a pretty big 155. I mean, she wasn't huge, but she was huge. She wasn't huge, but she was huge. Not like she was like six, six footer at 155, but I think she was about like five, seven, five, eight, lean, muscle mass. Um, so she, she didn't look like she looked like a very sizable 155. You know, you stack her next to 155 dude, she probably looked bigger than most 155 dudes. That's what I would say. Most 155 men in the UFC at the highest level look smaller than Kayla Harrison. So she was big enough at 155. And then she fought like one time at 145, you know, last year in, in PFL, one time. Now she come over and cut it at 135, and I think that's gonna be a big cut because she's already seemed pretty leaned out at 155. She was able to come cut at 145, she looked healthy enough, but Another 10 pounds. It's not like she get any younger. It's not like she's 23, 24, 25 or nothing. 19, 18. She's not that. So weight kind of gets harder as you get older. Now you try to cut more weight than you ever cut before. And that's a big question. Like, can you do it? Are they getting rid of the 45 division for women? It would make sense to get rid of that division. But I feel like the reason you would bring Harrison over is so that you can revive that 45 division by bringing a big star over, maybe bringing some of the other PFL fighters over, maybe bringing some Invicta fighters over, and just kind of making a fake division and, you know, kind of bring some star power in there, like Holly Holm kind of come up there. Maybe you could entice Amanda Nunes to come out because Amanda Nunes has been hinting about she's going to, like, might, may or may not come back. She seems like she's bored in retirement. And Harrison coming over will be the perfect fight. You know, you're talking about hinting at maybe coming back. This will be the fight that would like no more hints. And I'm I want I wanted Hayla Harris. I mean, I wanted Kayla Harrison. She's here now. And that's a big legacy fight. Cause you've seen what the last woman's bandweight championship, like that that fight just shows like, yeah, it was right for a man to retire. Like, yeah, she could go out and beat those women for 10 more defenses, but like it don't really don't mean nothing. They're gonna they're gonna talk trash like her division was trash. So I already got my d- defenses and I don't want to get Juliana peanut again. I know I'm better than all these women. There's always a chance you could lose a fight, so it's a fist fight. But beating them don't really do much for me. I already beat Eric, pretty much everyone in his weight class. Repel, Kel Pennington is not on my level. I beat her before. Oh, um, what's her name? Myra Bonasova. She's a fellow Brazilian. I want her to be great. But she choked. She was, was on my level either. But I was hoping she was at least good enough to beat Kel Pennington so another Brazilian had the belt. But, yeah, it's definitely interesting. Like, as far as coming over, I was thinking it would be a Manny Nunes fight, not a Holly Holm fight. But I guess it's a fight to get your feet wet. But also, at the same time, it's a scary fight as well, because well, Holly Holm has been a former champion. She's a solid fighter. She's been improving upon her graph. And then you're fighting at 35. It's not at 45. It's not at 55. It's at 35. So can you even make the weight? Will you be drained? And then it will be a, a five-round fight? Who knows? You know, it's a lot of question marks with that fight. But it is a, you know, a whole interesting scenario and interesting turn of events. But how you feel about her coming to the UFC and fighting at 35 and Holly Holm is her first opponent? Yeah, I'm man. Ever since I saw Kayla Harrison fight Aspen Ladd, I was like, I thought she would be so more impressive w- over someone that she should be dominant, and she was dominant. But like, I could have, I could have easily seen, you know, Kayla Harrison putting her away, and that that putting a stamp on why the UFC wants to buy in. But it might have been an off night. It might have been one of those days. I I, I don't know a hundred percent. I think the realest competition she could face right now is probably Holly Holm. Like as far as like, she's a veteran. Uh, Kayla Harrison's been working her way up to get into the UFC. Now she's finally here. And uh, I just think, I think it's exciting. I'm I'm glad it's on, it's on UFC 300, right? Yeah, it's on UFC 300. Okay. So yeah. So I, I think it adds a lot of, uh, it, it gives the women some validity in UFC 300. Cause I, I'm excited to see it. 
Um, I think Holly Holmes is going to be a huge test. And if, if she's not careful, something could happen, but I do think, uh, Kayla Harrison coming over reignites hopefully the 145 because there's nothing going on there. It, the only time there was was when Cyborg fought Nunes and like other than that it's been pretty dull. Like I I feel bad for Amanda Nunes because she hasn't had quality talent and hopefully Kayla Harrison has learned enough to where she can give Amanda Nunes a run for her money and I I just I would love to see that fight. Uh, Amanda Nunes hits like a brick like. I could imagine her punching me as hard as I've been punched by anybody. You know what I mean? I, she's got a some very, a lot of a lot of power behind those punches, and it, it just looks like it hurts. So if Kayla Harrison's not careful on that one as well, she could get hurt. So I mean, it's exciting. So I, I I'm excited for that fight. Um, I'm ready for it. I I I I think it's a huge test for Kayla Harrison. I think she like she's. She's got to look at this as like a championship style fight because she is fighting a former champion and someone who's very dangerous, even at, you know, at the point in her career that she's at. So I'm super excited for it. All right, cool. But yeah, you mentioned 45 again. This is at 35. So that's very right, weird. Right, like, yeah. I yeah, feel I, like in, yeah. I feel like you're going to invest in Harrison. Why not put this fight at 45? How the home. So she, she didn't win the 45 belt. She lost to Jermaine Durand me for the vacant or yeah, the belt. So she has fought for the 45 belt before, and Holly Holm has experienced that 45. So why not have this at 45? It's not like Holly Holm, you know, came up from 25 to 35 or has only spent time at 35. So it would make sense to go to 45 and make it at 45. And then you could get bring Cyborg back. Even though you may not like Cyborg, you could bring her back. She could do wonders for the 45 division, especially you could bring Pacheco over who beat um, Harrison. So you could have bring Pacheco over, bring Cyborg over, bring Nunes back, and have um, – Kayla Harrison and maybe throw two other people in there, have a tournament for the vacant belt or maybe a tournament to fight Amanda Nunes for, you know, a tournament that the winner fights Amanda Nunes for the vacant 45 belt. That would be the wonders though. A rematch, you people have been wanting to see a rematch or it's been interesting to have a rematch for um Cyborg versus Nunes. People have been wanting the Harrison versus Nunes fight. That would have been big. And then Pacheco still has, you know, history with um Kayla Harrison. So you would probably want to see that again to, you know, get that win back. But um yeah, it's a lot of different things to play about, but the fact at 35 don't really make the most sense because you have a dying 45. Why not at 45? But we don't know what the UFC's working on, but that completes the podcast. Thanks for watching, guys and girls. Like, comment, subscribe, and come back for more podcasts and videos. Peace.